Welcome to Arizona State Museum Zoom Wrapped in Color Talk Series. I'm Lisa Falk, Head of Community Engagement for the museum, and I'll serve as your host this evening. As many of you know, Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona, and we're located in Tucson. We are situated on land that has been stored by and home to indigenous people for 13,000 years. Today, the Tucson area is home to the Atum and Pasco Yaqui, and there are 22 federally recognized tribes with reservation lands in the state of Arizona. The museum's collections and research focus on the indigenous people of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico, and we present programs exploring the history and cultures of this region. This year's Zoom Talks are in association with our new exhibit, Wrapped in Color, Legacies of the Mexican Strape, and I hope you will get a chance to see it. We hope to have an online version of it in the new year. So keep your eyes out on that. At this point, let me introduce tonight's speaker, photographer and author, Joe Coca. For 40 years and on five continents, Joe has photographed traditional textile artists, creating intimate portraits illustrating the work of hands and the everyday life of weavers. His work is included in many, many books published by Thumb Books and others. His book, The Human Thread, published in 2019, brings together a selection of his stunning photographs documenting these rich textile traditions. Through his photographs, Coca shares the lives, environment, communities, and skills of weavers. In his presentation, he will share the trials and tribulations associated with documenting traditional weavers and the remarkable photographs that result from building relationships with his subjects. And at this point, I'm gonna turn the platform over to master photographer, Joe Coca. Well, hello, and uh, thank you for all for participating in this Zoom presentation of my book. I appreciate it, and I hope I can entertain you a bit and explain how some of these photos came about. But first, I need to give you a brief history of myself so you know where I'm coming from. In 1978, I was just out of art school, and from the Art Center in Los Angeles. I had just moved back to Fort Collins where I had lived for six years while going to college at Colorado State University and then working for the university for a couple of years. I was back and trying to start my photography business. I was logging around my portfolio to every editor and art director I could find. And someone told me that a woman in Loveland was starting a new magazine and I needed to talk to her. I had no idea what kind of magazine it was, and, but it was photography work and I needed work. So I went to see her. Uh, the woman was Linda Ligon and she had a small newsletter she was publishing at the time called Interweave Press. And she was gonna come out with a brand new magazine. A few months after I talked to her, she called me and asked if I would like to do some work for her. I told her I'd love to. And this was the first issue of the magazine. It was one of the, the first of hundreds of covers I did for Interweave Press and a bunch of other magazines that they produced, such as Spinoff and then Piecework. Then they did a lot of books. I shot a lot of different kinds of books, the weaving, the spinning, uh, herbs, cookbooks, beadwork books, knitting, crocheting. Uh, uh, what are herbs for health books? Tons of them. Uh, my first trip out of the United States was not to photograph textiles, but to photograph herbs for this magazine that Interweave Press was doing. Uh, we had gone to a research station along the Napo River, the tributary of the Amazon. And this was to interview a shaman and photograph him and his extensive herbal garden growing along the river. Uh, this was sunrise on the river. Uh, we had to go through Iquitos, Peru to get to the research station. And Iquitos is a photographer's equivalent of a kid in a candy shop. No matter where I turned, there was an exotic scene to capture. This was an herbal doctor's shop on the streets of Iquitos. He seemed to have an herb to cure almost any ailment. This was the shaman we were there to photograph. We were there with a small group of botany types 
And one of them asked the shaman if he would do an ayahuasca ceremony for us. Ayahuasca is a brew made from some of the plants the shaman had in his garden. It is used by the local people of the region to talk or connect to the spirit world. <laughs> Once you drink the brew, you tend to hallucinate like crazy. He agreed to do the ceremony, mixed up the brew, and then told me I could not take any more photos. Oh crap, that was not my plan. He explained that the flash I was using because it was getting so dark would be bad for the participants. Okay, I thought, I have no choice but to stop. So I told him if I couldn't take photos, I wanted to participate in the ceremony. And this was one of those, beware of what you wish for. I drank some of the brew and he told me to go sit over by a tree near the hut we were at. Told me it would affect me in about 20 minutes. 20 minutes came, nothing seemed to be happening to me. I decided to get up and tell him the brew didn't work. Well, first I couldn't stand up. My legs would not cooperate. Then the sky turned colors and the most vivid scene of the night that I remember is a friend of mine dancing through the stars in her wedding dress. And then I'm swatting at bugs that were not there. Needless to say, the night was long, somewhat terrifying, but very interesting. My adventures with Linda didn't start with the Amazon trip. This photo was done in a bayou in Louisiana. This gentleman was a healer we were interviewing for a story. He took us back there in a small canoe because I wanted to photograph him in the I wanted to photograph him in the bayou. On our way there, I was photographing everything I saw. One of the subjects was a beautiful bird sitting on a log. I'm taking pictures of it and he starts yelling at me to stop taking photos. I stop, he tells me I'm robbing the bird of its soul and not to do that anymore. He was really angry. Lynn and I looked at each other and wondered if he was just gonna dump us off in the swamp and no one would ever find us again. So from a photographer's standpoint, if you're a photographer, technically it's just a, a battery powered strobe through an umbrella on camera left. And that was it, as well as dragging a shutter for capturing the ambient light that was there. Uh, we went to cover an Indian powwow at the Crow Agency and uh, just north of the Little Bighorn Battlefield. They had dancing competitions throughout the day and this was a dancer at sunset. In 2010, I went to cover the Tinkui Conference in the Sacred Valley of the Urumbamba River in Peru. It was a conference put on by the Center for Traditional Textiles, Cusco, run by a Nilda Alvarez. It was a gathering of all the weaving villages CTTC worked with in Cusco. There were 10 at this time. All of the weavers from each village came to the conference. Plus there were some from different countries as well as guest speakers invited for their expertise on textiles. It was after the conference had ended and I was having dinner with Linda Ligon and a couple of other people. And we got around to talking what we had seen at the conference. What stood out the most to me were the elders I had seen. And I said, wouldn't it be great to photograph all those faces? I think Linda said, we should do a book. Nilda stated, she could arrange all of that. Well, three years later, Linda's new publishing company, Thrums, came out with Faces of Traditions, Weaving Elders of the Andes. That started a run of other books on traditional textiles throughout the world that Thrums did, and I got to photograph them, and it was a hell of a lot of fun. This is one of the last books 
we were working on, and we were going to go back to China to launch the book just as the COVID pandemic hit. And we missed celebrating its launch with Wang Jun, one of the authors that we had worked with, and he had shown us a great part of China. As I stated earlier, Faces of Tradition was the start of the traditional textile books we did and how human threads came about in the end. This is also the only book where all of the photos of the elders I extensively lit from a professional photography standpoint. I had five cases of equipment, an assistant who also had an assistant. We would set up a studio, a small studio at every village where we were photographing elders or at a location where I thought the background was better to work with. This weaver was on her way to the village we were going to work in, but we had stopped just short of the village to have coffee because it was very early in the morning. The weaver had just come from the valley behind her and she looked wonderful in the, her traditional garments. We asked her to stay and we madly set up the lighting and the lighting for any photographer was a big soft box to camera right, a large reflector to camera left. I even had a scrim blocking the very harsh sunlight hitting her at that time of the day. My camera was tethered to a laptop so we could see what I was getting and also allowed me to adjust lighting and other things, much like instant Polaroids, made things really easy. I did that throughout all of this book. Um, the rest of the books, managed to not use so much equipment. This is one of my favorite photos in the book. Came about totally by accident. We were going to visit this woman to look at her weavings with no intent of photographing her. She lived in the village of Chinchero. Chinchero sits at almost 13,000 feet. And to get to her house, you had to walk uphill for about an eighth of a mile. I told our van driver that we did not need the equipment and probably because of my bad Spanish, he misunderstood me. And as we were inside the woman's house, he carried all of the equipment up the hill by himself and it was waiting for me outside when I came out. I felt so bad when I saw it and was about to apologize profusely when the woman came out, sat down where you see her. I looked at her and thanked the gods for time mistakes. We set up the lighting. She had even brought her own prop, the ball of yarn. And the chicken wandered in from who knows where at just the right time. I didn't change a thing in this shot. From a lighting standpoint, soft box on the right, big white reflector on the left. This guy, we uh, photographed him in front of his house against the, the mud wall. He, we propped the bench, some of his weedings on the bench, a uh, sheepskin on the ground because his, he had been, his, just his feet were in the, the dirt. And he never stopped spinning while we photographed him. So it was softbox on the camera right, big white reflector, camera left. So the interesting things you see along the way. We were photographing one of the elders at a lake that was sacred to the village and they wanted that elder photographed there. As my assistant and I were setting up the equipment, we are dragging, we are out of breath. We move some equipment, have to sit for a little while, move some equipment, have to sit for a little while to catch our breath. We found out later that the location we were working at was somewhere just above 14,000 feet. And these gals were off in a rock-filled, uneven field having a blast playing soccer. All these villages were always, I was always looking for great backgrounds to photograph these people in front of. And uh, this village had these beautifully painted walls. 
So I did the profile of this woman against this yellow wall. I love photographing elders' hands. They always have so much character. She was 90 years old, almost blind, but she never stopped spinning. These women were, as I say, these women were always spinning. The minute they sat down, they were spinning. A lot of them walked around still spinning. I could barely get these ladies to stop to, so I could just get this picture. I took this photo at the time, not knowing what the colorful borders meant. I just liked the colors and patterns. I didn't realize they were looking for husbands. So the humorous story about photographing these two sisters was about the location. I wanted an interesting background, and found this house next door to the weaving co-op building. When we asked the owner for permission to use the house, he thought we were from the electric company finally coming to hook him up for electricity. And he was ecstatic. It was a bit sad, really sad, to tell him we were not from the electric company, but he still let us use the house. At each village uh, weaving co-op, we would bring a large sack of coca leaves for the elders. Coca le leaves are chewed all day here for energy and to cope with the high altitude. At this village, each elder got her share and immediately stashed her share in her hat. So all those hats you see there are stuffed with coca leaves. This is the village of Santo Tomas. It's like an eight hour drive on a dirt road south of Cusco. And all the women in the village wear the same color and fashion for a, uh, for a certain period. And then at some point in time, someone decides that the colors should change for the year. When we were there, it was red. The following year, it was blue. And the last time I was in Cusco, the Santo Tomas women were all in purple. Uh, we went to the island of Taquile on Lake Titicaca to do some work. This is sunrise on Lake Titicaca with Bolivia in the foreground. Background, excuse me. The women did all the weaving. Very young weaver here, learning, learning the ropes. The men did all the knitting. Uh, this man is uh, knitting a cap just like the one he's wearing, it's called a chulo. We did some work in uh, the Chiapas region of Mexico. This gal's name was Carmen. She was one of four sisters at a home, we, four or five sisters at a home we came across on our travels throughout Chiapas. All but one of the sisters were mute and only conversed in sign language. Imagine being in a raucous party where everyone is talking over everyone else and you can understand nothing. These girls were doing this same thing, but in sign language. They were all signing at the same time and pushing and shoving each other. But they all did beautiful embroidery. This was an elderly resident near the uh, village of Las Margaritas in Chiapas. I was just wandering through the village. I found her in my bad Spanish. I asked her if I could take her picture. She nodded and hopefully she understood because I got her picture. This is a patron same procession in the village of Santa Marta and Chiapas. If you ever go to Chiapas or Guatemala, 
during Holy Week, you will not regret it, it is godly colorful. Your afternoon nap. This was at uh, San Juan Bautista Church in Shamul, Chiapas. These panels are part of the door frame of this church. This is a Zapatistas church in Chiapas. The Zapatistas are a political or a militant group in Mexico that still control a great part of uh, Chiapas. The masks are one of their symbols. And we would run into them every once in a while, usually at a small village. And as you entered the village, there was always something strung across the road, like a rope. So you had to stop and they would come and ask you to, you, you, they, were at, they would ask you for a fee to go through the village and you had no choice but to pay the fee. So we did. In the Chiapas region of Mexico, you have to be really careful photographing people. Um, normally they will not allow you to. One of the village, in one village we wanted to work in literally told us to get out. Here in uh, Zinicantan, uh, you can get arrested for photographing people or get a rock thrown at you or both. Uh, we would always talk to the mayor of each village before we did anything. And if he said we could, I would still ask permission of someone. These ladies, let me take their photograph. These are ceremonial clowns called spider monkeys in the village of Quinta Obispo in Chiapas. This was a Semana Santo festival. They're running through burning straw as an act of purification. And these ladies were just preparing us lunch from for photographers as to how this photograph was done. It was just a simple speed light bounced off a wall to fill in the shadows. We went to photograph this book in, with Deborah Chandler and Teresa Cordon. One of the first books I had photographed for Interweek Press was a how to weaving book with Deborah Chandler way back in the, I think it was the 1980s. And it was great to work with her again. She and Teresa lived in Guatemala or still live in Guatemala and had a, an extensive knowledge of all of the areas we were working in and the, and the people we were working with. This was a scarf vendor in Antigua, Guatemala. Antigua is a beautiful city. This was a Palm Sunday procession in Nebach, Guatemala. I was in my hotel room early in the morning here in Nebach when I heard a loud commotion outside the room. I looked out, saw a crowd of people coming down the street with a priest riding a donkey at the head of the procession. Everyone was in the shadows, but ahead of the procession was one shaft of light coming from a cross street from the morning sun. And luckily I was on the second floor of this hotel and I had a tiny balcony. I scrambled out there and waited until the priest came into the light and shot the picture. The women here, are wearing their handwoven carrying cloths called tizuts, and I probably totally pronounced that badly. <laughs> it was part of the procession that passed by my second floor room in Nebach. As I mentioned before, I like finding nice backgrounds to photograph to photograph these elders 
in front of. This was the woman's personal altar in her house. This was early morning in Nidba. Going to work, going to market. This couple was going, they were going to market. For the photographers in the group, this weaver was sitting in front of a large whitewashed wall in the in her backyard. And the sun just happened to be hitting the wall, lighting her up. And I used a white reflector behind her to open the shadows. I don't think the uh, family behind her knew they were going to be in the picture. This is a procession of girls carrying a heavy platform bearing an effigy of the Virgin Mary. The Semana Santos processions in Guatemala are really colorful spectacles. And almost every village has some kind of, of procession going on. I changed the uh, original photograph to black and white to emphasize her wrinkles. Not a, not a good fashion thing, I guess. She was one of the elders that we photographed in Guatemala for this book. She was a, a spinner, weaver. Her entire family was there when we photographed the thing. This is a hospi, hospi weaver. Uh, they weave, or they, yeah, they weave this cloth um, that is later made into their uh, cortas or their skirts. And, or kind of like what she's wearing. It's uh, Guatemala's version of ecot. This was a blanket weaver in Momos Tenango. He had worked at that loom all his life making blankets. For the photographers, this was, uh, I'm using a battery powered monostrobe with an umbrella, camera left, reflector camera right, dragging a shutter for capturing the ambient light as much as possible. Uh, this man had been a master embroiderer and now lived in a tiny room that was really dark. He was, basically blind. And while he sat talking to us, I set up a silver reflector outside of his door and shined it on him. We got this picture. This is Lake Atilan in the morning light with a fisherman going out to do his thing. Uh, this weaver, I just photographed her outside her house. It was perfect for, you know, what she was dressed like and the colors, and the thing she has on her head, which I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it, is, oh, they're, they're individually wound around and uh, it just takes forever to make the whole thing that she puts on her head. Here's one of those shots where we're driving along and all of a sudden I'm yelling at the driver to stop the car. And I want to get out and take a picture. Happened a lot. Susan Davis, the author of the Morocco book and I went to Morocco to photograph traditional weavers for another Thrones book. She had lived in Morocco for many years, spoke fluent Arabic. And she took some marvelous places throughout Morocco. She and I had just finished talking to the rug vendors in the rug market in the Medina and Marrakesh. And I came out, came across the spice cellar, 
the sun was just going down and the gods granted me this photo. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> just one of the rug weavers in Morocco. Almost every weaver we worked with in Morocco had their looms in tiny, very dark rooms. I was amazed they could do any work. So from a technical standpoint, this is just a little speed light bounced off the wall on the left. We spent a couple of days at this woman's house in Nakab. We photographed not only her, but what seemed like the entire village of women who did weaving there. What was really fascinating for me was the fact that the Moroccan weavers we worked with were ungodly hospitable, hospitable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we would get to their house or home. And first it was as, as a welcoming thing. First, it was sweet tea or, and then sweet and sweets or bread to welcome us. Then around mid morning, again, tea and something. Then lunch. Then a mid afternoon treat with just with tea. And just before leaving, tea and sweets again. What a wonderful place. But the funny part about some of them was a lot of times I was served by myself. Uh, the men were served by themselves and the women went somewhere else. A lot of times I ended up eating lunch by myself. And for photographers, they, the lighting was a small speed light bounced into a reflector in the window on camera left and a battery powered monolight bounced off the wall on camera right for Phil. This is the Medina of Fez, or the all wall part of the city. This is a wonderful place to see and a wonderful place to get really lost. We were photographing this girl's mother and this young girl kept appearing just off camera. And each time she appeared, she would be dressed in something totally different. When I finished with her mother, I asked her mother if I could take her daughter's picture, to which she agreed, thankfully. These are the things you see on your way home. And this is another one of those times to yell at the driver to stop the car. I actually learned how to say stop in Arabic for just this reason. Uh, but I have no idea or no clue how to pronounce it today, unfortunately. We were on our way to an interview with a weaver when we came upon what was like a, what I call a country fair or a rodeo. It was a traditional Moroccan horsemanship competition where the object of the game is to ride a group of horses as fast as you can and in a straight line. And just before you reach a certain line, you fire off your black powered rifle, keeping the horse under control. And hopefully the group is in a straight line and thank God they stopped where they were supposed to. Otherwise I probably would not be sitting here talking to you. And their tack was beautiful. Lunch, kebabs. We weren't photographing any weavers here, but we were on our way to a, another location. I convinced Susan we had to stop here to satisfy my curiosity, and she indulged me. It was an amazing place, and it's called the, the Blue City, and really almost every building in this city is, is painted blue. The authors, uh, Joshua 
Kirstein and Maren Beck have been traveling in Laos for over 20 years, buying the beautiful silk weaving produced by the Lao weavers or Lao women. And we got to tag along. The woman here is reeling silk thread off the cocoons. And the byproduct of the boiling pot of cocoons is a cooked silk larva, which are good eaten. They taste like popcorn. Uh, this woman is weaving a traditional skirt called a sin, which all the women in Lao wear. This was so uh, sunset. This was a young weaver we photographed. She would come home from school and immediately start weaving. Um, she had won a bunch of awards and her loom, as all the, all the looms in uh, Laos, uh, sit outside underneath a, a, a deck. A fisherman on the Mekong River in Luang Prabang. This was an interesting side stop in Laos. His father made small metal souvenirs from leftover bombs and shells the US dropped over Laos during the Vietnam War. Local villagers would bring whatever they found to him. The farmers still come across some of the unexploded ordnance while uh, tilling a field or working in a rice paddy and they can still cause injuries. And funny, but one of the souvenirs I brought bought from him was a peace sign made from this leftover ordinance. <laughs> I normally don't pay for pay someone to take their picture, but this was one exception. She was paddling along one of the villages on this lake and I wanted to, I wanted a photo of her. She would only let me do it if I gave her a bit of cash. And I thought it was worth it. It's quite the babysitter there. This was a fish market in the south of Sem Reap. It smells there. We took two trips to China to complete this book. And we were on our way back for the third trip to launch it when the pandemic hit and we had to terminate all of our travel. These were women creating warps from the indigo dyed yarn. This was a really dark place to do a photo in. The only light was coming from the window and the door in the background. And I used uh, two speed lights on stands just off camera to right and left to bounce them into the ceiling just to fill the shadows a little bit. And uh, use a really sh slow shutter speed with the camera on a tripod. These are women dyeing cloth in vats of indigo. Again, just a little speed light bounced off the wall to help um, with the uh, slow shutter speed for ambient light. And again, I tell you, I love photographing hands. This was an indigo dyer in China. This was a rural workshop that we visited. She was not only her, but there were a bunch of, of, of weavers at this shop. They were all weaving uh, yards and yards of cloth. This woman, she was painting wax or putting wax on a cloth with a feather to do 
resist dying. And the only light coming into the area she was working in was the window at her upper right. And I only, uh, to take the photograph, uh, only thing I used was a large reflector camera left to pop light back into her and, and the room. These are two elderly women in their brilliant indigo robes. I was just walking in the village, came around a corner and this was the scene. We had gotten to the lodge we were staying at late one night, well, late at night. It was really dark. I had no idea what the surrounding countryside looked like. But when I looked out the window of my room in the morning, this is what greeted me. I went outside, set up my camera, and just started taking pictures. I watched this person slowly coming down the rice paddy path, and I waited until they got to just the spot I wanted, and I took the picture. I walked through one of the villages and everyone was preparing for the rice planting season. The whole village was like this. They're preparing flats with uh, dirt, uh, night soil, and uh, then the rice on top. And then they would stick it into a hot house to germinate it before they put it into the rice paddies. For Spider Woman's children, we drove through miles and miles of dirt roads with two Navajo authors, the Teller Sisters, to photograph the amazing weavers on the Navajo reservation in northwestern New Mexico and northeastern Arizona. This was a Shiprock Peak. It's very sacred to the Navajos and it's on the Navajo reservation. We had been in Canyon de Shea to photograph three generations of Navajo weavers, and she was the youngest. This was a view from Muley Point in Utah. We were looking into uh, Monument Valley, and the San Juan River is just at the bottom of this photograph. And you can't see the river, but it's there. This one of the uh, Navajo weavers we photographed for the book. She literally lived right alongside ship, uh, the Ship Rock Peak. It was actually to the west of the peak. The lighting was just a reflector on camera left. This was a traditional Navajo Hogan with a modern touch. When we got to this weaver's house, I could not find a place to photograph her. I walked all around her house, just couldn't find anything. I kept, good. I kept getting further and further away from her house. And then I realized I just needed the sky as a background. We set it up, hauled a bench out there, put, a lot, put all her weaving on the bench. She wore her best jewelry and we got the picture. From a, from a technical standpoint, it was just a speed light on a light stand camera left to fill in the shadows. This is Canyon de Shea. It's a beautiful place with some amazing ancient ruins in it. But if you wanna go see anything, 
in the canyon, you first have to hire a Navajo guide to take you. Otherwise, they will not allow you in. But it is a very beautiful place. Went back to Guatemala to photograph another Thrums book on the rug hooking co-op Multicolores founded by Marianne Wise. The Guatemalan women there made some very beautiful rugs out of discarded t-shirts that you and I have donated to some organizations such as the Salvation Army or some other such place. This is one of the rug hooking artists. When we got to the, her house, it was raining like crazy outside. The only light was from the door, her doorway, and one tiny light bulb in her in her room. But luckily, the she had uh, whitewashed walls, so it's a battery powered uh, mono light through a, or bounced off an umbrella camera left and a speed light bounced off the wall camera right. This is Lake Atilan. We were based in Panachal. Panachal is the town uh, center left there. And each day we went out from the different village to photograph the, the co-ops that uh, Mary had arranged for us to work with. It's a beautiful lake. These were flower sellers in Chichi Castanengo. This is the Mayan and Catholic traditions intermixing. This is at the base of the Iglesia de Santo Tomas in Chichicastenego. In the background is the market there. It's quite an amazing place to go through. These are some of the um, artists from the one of the co-ops that Walter Colores works with the rug hooking co-op. I was standing in the rain taking this picture of them. Quite a colorful group. That's why I like to say that Americans are very boring or dress very boring compared to Guatemalans. This is the Sangre de Cristos. This is my home today. I left when I was 18 to go to college at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. I moved back in 2018 when I decided to more or less retire and I have not regretted it. So I would like to thank you for tuning into this presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry about the screw up at the beginning. Uh, I'll answer any questions you send, or if you need to buy a book or would like to buy a book, or any of my book or the other books I have mentioned, you can go to Amazon.com or Schieffer Publishing, uh, or if you're probably your weaving shop might uh, carry them, or if they don't, they tell them they should. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, your photos are absolutely incredible yeah. beautiful thank you for for sharing yeah. those um just amazingly gorgeous work um the questions we have a bunch of questions that kind of fall into two categories one um people are wondering uh, who are i assume not photographers if you could explain some of the photography terminology or if you had a picture showing your setup like what is a soft box um and some of the other materials that you talked about using um, reflector, sure. the, the strobes um, and things. If you could talk a little bit about that for those who, who don't um, 
no. And also, if you had any suggestions for setting up for for lighting um, photograph photograph of, of textiles that are flat, you know, to make them for illustrations. Okay. Uh, first, I'll deal with the softbox. The softbox is kind of imagine an umbrella that is covered with a, uh, uh, a transparent it has a transparent cover on one side, and you put a light in the middle of it and either shoot it through or bounce it off. The, and the inside is always white or silver, and you get a nice soft light. A uh, reflector is just a big white, uh, it could be a card. Uh, my reflectors are cloth, which are on a, uh, a, a stretcher stand. And you just put them on a stand and you bounce the light, any light that you want back into the subject. Uh, speed light is just a little tiny, basically the on-camera flash that you, you normally see in on cameras. Mine I put on stands and put them wherever I need or you know stick them in corners, put them on on cabinets, wherever I feel I want a little bit of light to come. Uh, other than that, as I try to sh use a computer every time or I, I try being tethered to a computer when I photograph the elders that where I'm having to light something, uh, the computer just allows me to see what we're getting, how to adjust different things. Um, it makes uh, taking pictures a little bit easier. So uh, they were wondering about how you light um, for setup and lighting um, photographs of, of text, flat textiles in a flat way for illustrations. Do you have any suggestions for that? Light on one side, reflector on the other. That's the easiest way to do it. Uh, uh, if you shoot, uh, if you do something in the sunlight, just have sunlight coming from one side, reflector on the other side, bounce it back into the cloth, you'll get nice texture. Uh, if you shoot in the shadows, uh, the photograph will be flat unless you add some light from say a reflector on one side, just bouncing a little bit of light into it. And it's actually, it's pretty easy. <laughs> Shouldn't say that, but it is. Helps if you have an assistant to hold the reflector. <laughs> that helps, that helps a lot actually. <laughs> are, are, your, are your reflectors always white? I know I sometimes use like at Christmas time when the gold foil came out to get a warmer light. Have you, are you, do you always use white light? I almost always use white light. We're trying to keep the, whatever cloth we're photographing, the true color. That makes sense. So uh, I use white for that. For some, for people, you know, I use silver, uh, depending on how much light I need. I rarely use the gold ones because I tend, to, they tend to warm things up too much. And I found that I can do that in a computer later on if I really need to. Yeah, I was shooting pre-computer days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know how that goes. Yeah, so the, the other set of questions really deals with, you know, I noticed that you, you from the looks of your photos, you have a really good rapport with your subjects. They're laughing, they seem at ease. And people were wondering if the people are compensated um, with money for getting the photographs or in some other way, or if you give them copies of your photos. Um. I, yes, I think they were compensated. Some of the elders we photographed for the books because we had to have them sign model releases. So for the model release, we normally gave them some kind of fee or I didn't, but Thrums did. And because uh, we needed the model release. Um, as I stated, I don't really, I don't really pay for photographs for, when I need, and you know, that one woman was the exception. All right. So you are, that was another question. You are getting um, releases for using the photographs and publications in other ways. Yes. We just found that was a, a uh, good way of, of, well, it helps because then they'll be more inclined to let us take their photographs. 
if we tell them we, we we'll give you a fee if you but you're gonna have to sign this release mm -hmm. and it probably well i know it, it it protects the publisher right and, and actually linda's here and she um wrote in the comments that um that they always compensated either individually or as groups the people you were photographing so um so there's a couple questions there's one about um from Sherry Hunter, she says, I like to photograph people too and found in 2011 that the Moroccan women and children were the most reluctant I had encountered in the world to be photographed. Has that changed? Also, I found that with the advent of digital photography, locals have loosened up when they can see their pictures immediately. Did you find that that helped for you too? Oh, in Peru. And, you know, as I said, uh, normally I used to, once we set up our little studio, uh, I set up my little studio and I was tethered to a computer. Uh, we would shoot the pictures and then show the subject what they look like. And they got a great kick out of it. Um, I'd get a whole village crowding around my computer just to see what we were doing. And it was really fun and really helpful because they could see exactly what, what they look like. One woman had told us she had never she hadn't seen herself in something like 20 years wow. and and uh, she was amazed at what she looked like on camera. Of course, you know, she needed, you know, was mad about her hair and all kinds of <laughs> stuff like that. But um, in Morocco, I, we never had any problem shooting people, mainly because, you know, Susan knew all these people and uh, it was we it was easy to photograph the the, the, the women there um as i stated where i a lot of times ate by myself at one point i was in a house photographing i was the only man in the house and there must have been probably a dozen women in the house and i was getting to photograph all of them and it was interesting. So you never had any problems. Um, you know, because of digital photography and everybody has an iPhone. Uh, actually, one of the problems, wasn't a problem, but one of the things that we did find was one of the markets we went to, um, the men, uh, you know, noticed that we were taking pictures and I would have young guys come up to me and wanted me to take their picture and wanted to be my Facebook friend and wanted a photograph so they could find a wife. And it went on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. Oh. Yeah. So Susan, um, the author of the Morocco book, is also here. And she said, um, in Morocco, Thumbs paid the art artisans. Plus, they gave each two copies of the book, which I guess is doable since you said Susan knew all the people. I was wondering, do, did you ever give copies of the photographs back to any of the women that you photographed? Yes, we did. Uh, one of the things we did, we, we let's see, where did we do this? Uh, we did it in Chiapas. And we did it in, I want to say Laos, but I'm not absolutely certain. But I remember in Chiapas, we would photograph for the day and then go find a uh, uh, like those one hour photo places. A lot of these villages have those for make doing passport pictures and things like that. And we I would take my uh, uh, little card in, um, drop it off for them and they would print us these little three by five photographs. Of, of everybody and then we take them back uh the next day and give it to them or if uh the author would give it to them later that's that's wonderful I, I imagine it's hard to find people much later so having that ability to do it instantaneously almost yeah it was it was really fun and it was uh and amazing enough you know the word gets around quickly and um it helps smoothing the way for another the next time you need to go photograph along one of those villages that makes sense um one other question uh it says your photos were of people wearing traditional dress do we assume those were the only people you chose to photograph or do a great many people in these cultural areas only wear traditional dress well almost all the places we were that was their normal dress 
like in Peru, they don't wear anything different. We never asked anybody to change. Uh, they always showed up with whatever, you know, that's, if you went there unannounced, that's what they'd be wearing. Hmm. Interesting. Well, there's a lot of uh, kudos to you. Thanks. How wonderful your photos and your career have been. And we'll be sending the, the chat and the questions to you later. Um, I want to thank you. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Joe, for sharing these gorgeous, amazing photographs and a little story of your journey as a photographer. Um, thank you. I'll look you up next time in, I'm in the rurals of Colorado, <laughs> where okay. we have DSL Good. internet. So thank you for braving this with us. We appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Bye.